right, let's talk about herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores. Jeremy, what's that? <laughs> it's a grizzly bear, brown bear you call them in Slovenia, okay? The perfect omnivore, besides ourselves, right? It eats berries, and, which are largely carbohydrates. They're sugar. There's not a lot of protein in there. There's not a lot of fat. And it eats salmon, which is full of fat and protein. In fact, during certain times of the year when salmon are plentiful, the bear doesn't even eat the protein. I've watched this. I'm a fly fisherman. I go to Alaska occasionally, go fly fishing. Bears will take the salmon, they'll grab the front end, they'll take their little teeth, not little teeth, and they'll skin <laughs> the salmon, leave the flesh on the salmon, and just eat the skin to get the fat. And then you go along, and if you don't catch a salmon that day fly fishing, you just pick up the carcasses because they're perfectly filleted salmon. <laughs> and you go home and you cook them up. We actually did this one time. It was pretty fun. <clears throat> so anyway, fat's important, protein, but this is basically the breakdown of where these things are getting it, okay? So this goes back to your project, your dissertation. There's two ideas out there, perfect mixing versus perfect routing, okay? The perfect mixing scenario is this one over here. You have berries and salmon. You add those things together inside the bear, and you add all of the stuff together, and the bear is made of a mixture of those two things, okay? The routing scenario where the bear takes the salmon, the protein in the salmon, to build the protein in its tissue, so it's directly routing the protein in, is this scenario. So even though the bear is eating these two things, the isotopic composition of its tissues looks like the salmon. It doesn't look like the berries. Okay? So those are two end member spectrums. Those are the, that's the spectrum, mixing to routing. Those are the two end members. Of course, reality is always somewhere in the middle, but those are our two end member spectrums. Perfect mixing versus perfect routing. Okay? Really important concept. So we have species that represent ends of the spectrum. So what are the mechanisms that differ between those species in how they handle protein or carbohydrates? Um, what are the mechanisms? What do you mean by that? If, if, is, if on one end of the spectrum I eat a fish and my, my mm -hmm. lipids are mixed from the other lipids that I ate, scenario one. Mm -hmm. And another species on the other end of the spectrum, the fish that I ate, those proteins are directly incorporated. Mm -hmm. Scenario two. Mm -hmm. what, what, how, what systems or mechanisms explain how those proteins are handled? It's, all, it's basically all supply and demand. So one, one mechanism, I'm just going to give you one answer, not the answer, but an answer. One mechanism is that the protein in your diet might not match your protein needs. Okay? So in, a diff so in addition to protein content, there's this idea of protein quality. Can you induce scenario two in a, in a species on the other end of the spectrum of changing the, the, the need in that species yep. stresses or other environmental things? Yep. Yeah, and changing the quality of the protein. Um, by spectrum, are you referring to like trophic level? No. Spectrum. Just spectrum over here. So the, the spectrum where you're basically taking everything in, you're breaking it apart, everything, into this elemental constituents and throwing it into a pool and then building everything up. Okay? Obviously, we're not talking about essential amino acids here, but like I said, the majority of them are not essential. So this potentially could be, this could be a scenario. Where the other ones is that you're bringing things in, but you're not breaking them up, and what really is going into making the tissues of the animal is the protein from the diet. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. So if It'll be your fault when we go over and people are hungry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you, if you can it. One problem is, is that when you do a mixing model, there's, a, there's an analytical problem here, is that when you're doing a mixing model, you're assuming this. <laughs> uh. Sample preparation protocols, on the other hand, which you were talking about, Jeremy, you assume this. Because what do you do the first thing when you get your prey sources? Is you lipid extract them. You basically remove everything that's not protein, and you're comparing the protein in the food to the protein in the animal, which assumes 100% routing. Okay? So our analytical protocols, methodological protocols for studying animals are kind of messed up. All right? They're assuming different parts of these, this end member spectrum. Okay, this kind of gets you to your question. 
So traditional textbook animal ecophysiology will say, okay, dietary carbohydrates and lipids go mostly to energy and lipid storage. You build fats with them because you need that energy at a later date, or you use them to do work, right? Glycolysis, for example. The dietary protein largely gets routed into protein tissue synthesis. This arrow's big, right? And not very much of it goes to energy, all right? So, but really, the size of these arrows and whether they're going that way or going straight in depends on what they have available to them, the quality of what they have available to them, and maybe some other factors like the need to reproduce, to make a fetus, to make babies, or to nurse those babies. So there's lots of other environmental demands on organisms that might change the size and direction of these arrows. Really important thing to keep in mind. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to skip ahead to nitrogen. We talked a little bit about carbon. I'm not going to talk too much about the lipid thing. <clears throat> uh, I will talk about this, though. And this gets back to your question about variation in tissue specifics. So if you take a mouse and you feed it the same diet its entire life, and then you get rid of it or you kill it or you kill the poor mouse, <laughs> which we do a lot of. We do it with CO2 asphyxiation. It's fast and painless. Um, you measure its tissues, bone collagen, blood, muscle, liver, hair. They're all going to have different carbon isotope values. How can that be? We call that tissue-specific discrimination. Okay? Why don't all the tissues have the same carbon isotope value? Because that mouse ate the same thing its entire life. And the reason is, is that different tissues have different amino acid concentrations. They're built with subtly different building blocks, okay? So if you look at this, and this is just some data from a, a paper that we published a few years ago, these are four different tissues that are commonly analyzed in ecology, and these are the amino acid compositions, concentrations here, we're not talking about isotopes, concentrations for the different aminos that we can measure. Some of them have wildly different Concentrations among tissues, like glutamic. Other ones, some of these essentials, like threonine, don't really vary across tissues, all right? But it's this difference in concentration coupled with the fact that amino acids can have wildly different carbon isotope values that leads to tissue-specific discrimination, okay? And you can figure that out by just using a mixing model where you take the concentration of a given amino acid, you times it by its carbon isotope value, plus the concentration of another amino acid times it by its carbon isotope value for all the different amino acids in a tissue, and you'll find, this is just an exercise you can do, but you'll find that different tissues have different isotope values, this being the carbon isotope value of the bulk tissue, the entire tissue. And that's what leads to tissue-specific discrimination. Okay, it's two things. Variation in carbon isotope values of different amino acids. This is the first paper to report it, by the way, in 1991. Coupled with the fact that different tissues have different amino acid concentrations. So it's just a mixing model problem. But that's what leads to that. Okay? All right.